Okay, well, 7.31 and we're not going to reward lateness, so I think we'll we'll make a make a start. Um, welcome everyone to, I think it's the 25th um, solidarity session that AFSA has been hosting since the start of the pandemic. Um, we realized it was a great online way to connect while we couldn't be physically together and continue our, our struggle collectively. Hi, Jared. Um, I would like to first acknowledge that I'm joining you from the unceded lands of the Jaja Wurrung and pay my respects to elders past and present and express my hope that, um, and, and active hope that we are farming in a way that is uh, healing this country and our relationships to it and her first peoples. And I invite all of you to put in the chat whose country you're joining from tonight and uh, help us all see which parts of this ancient country we're all on. And I'll also just quickly administratively say, we love it if people can have their cameras on because it's nicer when you're talking to be able to see faces. Although we do understand some of you may be indisposed or not have your pants on. And we accept that you might not put your cameras on in that case. Um, you also might not have the bandwidth for it. So that's another excuse. Um, but if you can, the cameras on are lovely. Uh, keeping, on the other hand, keep your sound off uh, so that we don't have to listen to the dog in the background uh, unless you're going to speak. And then if you'd like to ask a question or, or make a comment, you can do so either by sort of waving your hand on the camera or by raising your hand through the technology. Um, we're not really bothered by either of those. Um, I'm really excited to be having uh, to to welcome Sam and Mim to this discussion tonight. I had the uh, very uh, fortunate experience to meet them recently in England at a a dialogue at Wakelands in Suffolk, which is an agroforestry farm. Um, we had a, a dialogue hosted by the Oxford Real Farming College, and it was talking about uh, agroecology as rewilding, and. When I heard that there were going to be ecologists there as well as farmers, I didn't know that some of them were one in the same people, ecologists who are also farmers. And it was uh, it was a really pleasant experience to be with people who have such deep knowledge of ecology, who are applying that knowledge to the care for their own farms um, and to helping others think about how we farm. So that then made me think, well, we just have to have them here so more people have access to their, their wisdom and their wit. Um, I'm putting them under pressure now to be witty and wise, and <laughs> they are. Um, and it's also timely because uh, I'm on my way Friday to, the, to Montreal for COP15, which is the Biodiversity COP. Um, as you know, the Climate COP27 just finished, and now we're into biodiversity, so it's very it's very. Um, timely to be having conversations about the relationships between biodiversity and agroecology, which in a lot of UN instruments and other um, kind of policy spaces, the relationships not being acknowledged and there are big debates around land sparing versus land sharing, um, big debates about the role of carbon markets and carbon offsets, as we would propose are false solutions. Um, but we're not, I don't know if we're going to get to that tonight or if we're going to start stay with farm level discussions. So I'm going to pass over to Sam first, who's going to tell us about his wonderful work at Old Lands. And I think he's got, Sam, you have some pictures for us and things too, don't you, to see? Um, yeah, I'm afraid I do. I've got, I've got some slides. I hope it'll be uh, interesting. Um, and um, He always uh, says that, don't we'll make to people think. <laughs> we'll make people think about things in a, in a slightly different way. Um, but yeah, can I, can I, start by Go for it. presenting my screen if I can work out how to do that on uh, on here. Um, right, so share screen uh, entire screen. It's not giving me the option to share for some strange reason. <laughs> Uh, Jess, I don't know whether that's because I haven't got the permission to do it. Let me have a look. I saw before that she made you co-host, but... Right. There should be a little green button uh, at the bottom that says share screen. Yeah. 
Yep. And it then says entire screen or window, and I've clicked on that, and uh, and then the 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 share button is um, is blued out. Um, I mean, I can I can drone on anyway. It doesn't really need the pictures, um, but it's ni nice to have them. But I think maybe in the interest of uh, um, interest of keeping things going, it probably is going to be best if I just just talk. If that's okay. Um, so imagine imagine that there are some pictures to illustrate this. Uh, Try it but, now, yeah. Sam. I've actually made it so all participants just check it one more time. Okay, I'll try one last time. Ah, there we go. Cool. Okay. Right. So now I can put that on. There we go. Brilliant. Um, so yeah, I'm Sam Bosenket, and I've been involved in managing an area of wood pasture in southeast Wales for the last 20 years. Um, I'm going to kick things off with the bad news, just to set the scene. Um, we've lost a huge amount of semi-natural habitat over the last 60 years. A study in England showed nearly half of sites identified as semi-natural grassland in the 1960s have been lost by 2013. And figures from Wales show just 30% of the country now holds semi-natural habitat. The majority of that semi-natural habitat is in the uplands, and lowland Britain has lost well over 70% of its semi-natural habitat. With that habitat loss, there's been a huge yeah. loss of wildlife. Oh, sorry. Should, should we be seeing a, a, something more than a white screen? Oh, goodness. Yes, you should. <laughs> uh, right. Why is that not working? Sometimes it's okay. just if you've closed the wrong window. Yeah. Sorry, guys. Um, let's try again. Okay. Maybe that'll work. That works. Yeah, that works. Okay, there we go. Right, sorry. <laughs> we'll get there in the end. Um, so we've lost loads of habitat. With that habitat loss, there's been a huge loss of wildlife. Uh, the Royal Society for Protection of Birds are saying that more than 40 million birds have been lost from the UK since the 1970s. And the Natural History Museum reports a 60% decline in insect abundance in just 20 years. Most of that loss has been to agriculture, as we'll see on the next slide. But that doesn't mean that agriculture is inherently bad for biodiversity. And I profoundly disagree with George Monbiot's recent book, Regenesis, on, on this point. Until the intensification of the 20th century, agricultural land was extremely biodiverse and less intensive farming systems, both in Britain and elsewhere in Europe, retain very significant biodiversity. So think of the grazed flower rich cork oak woodlands uh, of the De Hesse in Spain, shown in the, in the picture here, um, or the small pastures and vineyards of the south of France. They hold phenomenal numbers of flowers, insects and birds. The key thing is that they're old landscapes managed traditionally without excessive fertilizer. And nearby areas of both France and Spain have intensively farmed landscapes with almost no nature at all. My memory of my cousin's farm near Bathurst in New South Wales is also with huge numbers of birds in their mix of pasture and open woodland. So it isn't farming that causes loss of biodiversity, it's intensive farming. The other thing that needs to be pointed out is that semi-natural open habitats hold very different species to woodland or scrubland. And so agri and agricultural management really is the only way of maintaining biodiverse open habitats uh, rather than wooded scrubby ones. Um, the paper that I mentioned uh, about habitat loss on the, on the last slide shows that almost all the losses of grassland have been to agriculture, 88% overall in the UK, most of it to improved grassland and, and quite a lot to arable. It also showed that losses were far worse on non-protected land than on designated sites. Um, there's a growing movement against government regulated protection uh, of, of sites in the UK, but removal of those designations certainly in the past would have been catastrophic for nature. And I, I think still going forward, it, it would be uh, very, very bad for, for, for nature. We, we do need some form of protection of the, the very best land. Anyway, after that slightly ranty start, I'd probably better introduce my study area. Old lands is a 180 acre mixed farm near Monmouth in southeast Wales. It's on undulating ground at around 50 meters altitude and it's got circumneutral clay loam soils. 
Most of the area was ploughed during the 1950s and 60s under government su subsidies uh, and was then farmed by my uncle from the early 1970s. He was a low intensity traditional farmer with be beef, sheep and arable and farmland wildlife continued to do reasonably well during his tenure. He treasured the anthills in patches of grassland which had escaped the plough. He only used fertiliser where it was necessary and he left a lot of cereal fields as stubbles over the winter and they filled with flocks of birds. In his last few years of farming, he took advantage of set-aside payments um, and was paid by the government to take three arable fields out of production. Uh, those have now become our most flower-rich fields. So in the late 1990s, the landscape was like this. Um, most of the fields have been ploughed and we used for cereal growing, which is shown in red on the map. Um, but the Mill Meadow, Far Conicot and the Alders, which are three of the fields down in the south here, uh, were set aside in the 1990s. And there were only species rich natural grassland patches in about four or five places on the entire landscape. Um, the lawns around the big house uh, and a couple of other little field corners. The yellow there is species poor grassland that had been um, fertilized too much to hold very many flowers. The lawns around the house retain almost the only ancient grassland in our landscape and each autumn grassland fungi fruit there. I've been documenting their diversity for nearly 20 years. One lawn is much richer than the other and this richness has recently been confirmed using environmental DNA studies. The reason for this is that the, the North Lawn was ploughed for potatoes during the Second World War 80 years ago and despite identical management since then um, it still hasn't recovered to the same diversity of fungi that we have in the South Lawn um, which is less than 50 meters away. The Lawn Meadow which is adjacent to the South Lawn was last ploughed 40 years ago and it's far worse with just eight species left in it um, and nothing recolonizing at all. So going back to my introductory slides, it really is crucial that we protect ancient semi-natural grassland because it's just as difficult to, difficult to restore genuine grassland biodiversity and soil diversity as it is to restore ancient woodland. But still, it's better to try with restoration than to give things up as lost. My uncle moved to a smaller farm just after 2000 and usually generational changes when farms are tidied up by a new young farmer wanting to make their mark. Luckily, my family wanted to protect our fields. So when two new young farmers took over the tenancies on what had been my uncle's land, we put things in place to prevent damage. I need to fess up now. I'm not a real farmer. Um, I'm a landowner uh, who has inherited some land from, from my family. But that meant that I was, we were able to choose a different path um, and make our land do different things um, rather than being driven entirely by the market uh, and needing to maximize the productivity of every acre. We drew up tenancy agreements with the two new tenants, which included ecological safeguards, basically no plowing of permanent pasture and no fertilizer except farmyard manure. And in return for that, they paid a much lower than market rent. Um, then a government agri-environment scheme kicked in uh, in the early 2010s. One of them entered it and they were then paid by the Welsh government to farm in an environmentally friendly way. They were also paying us a lower rent. So he benefited, the environment benefited, and we avoided the reseeding and slurry spreading that would otherwise have occurred. Our environmental guidelines worked and flowers and insects increased in most fields, although the grassland fungi remain conspicuously absent. Um, those farmers' conventional non-intensive farming was leading to slow improvements in biodiversity. One of them decided to move to Devon in 2016 and management was then taken on by the local wildlife trust. They started to manage specifically to increase species richness through a combination of hay cutting to reduce nutrients and aftermath grazing. The parasitic flower yellow rattle appeared in a couple of fields arriving accidentally on hay cutting equipment and has started to reduce the grass dominance although the fields closest to external, external ammonia sources are still stubbornly grassy. The Wildlife Trust tried seeding in wildflower seeds from one of their nature reserves to our least flower rich field a couple of years ago, but nothing has taken at all, probably because the grasses are just so well established there. Creating a wildflower meadow really isn't as simple as spreading seed. And as the fungi show, it takes decades to get back a fully functioning ecosystem. Since Claire and I took on management of the fields from the Wildlife Trust in 2020, I've been able to mark off areas to be dodged during hay cutting so that late flowering plants like knapweed can flower as a late season nectar source 
and have been able to protect rarer species until they set seed. Since management changed to deliberate grassland restoration, the diversity of flowers and insects has rapidly overtaken that of the remaining fields in our landscape. I mentioned the grassiness of a couple of the fields and it's worth another brief aside. Um, airborne ammonia moves from intensively managed farms onto all surrounding habitats and causes eutrophication. So enrichment of the, um, of the, of the, of the soil and enrichment of the plants that grow on it. Grasses, nettles and docks benefit and wildflowers are outcompeted. And things are even worse in ecosystems like woodlands or heathlands where bryophytes or lichens play a key role because even relatively low concentrations of ammonia cause damage to them. So whatever you do on your land, please remember that air pollution from surrounding intensive agriculture will affect your management. Uh, if you're changing management or rewilding an area, it may well be taken over by nitrogen loving plants like brambles. Uh, Uh, rather than the species you think or hope. Uh, we've still got lots of relatively species poor grassland in, in yellow, but the species rich grassland in green has expanded substantially, especially in the three former set aside fields, which are now almost entirely species rich. The move straight from set aside to extensive beef grazing, so basically from arable stubbles into grazing, um, led to a far quicker transition to flower rich grassland than we've seen in other fields which were cereal and then were sown with grass lays. Uh, before grazing. Um, and that seems to match what's been noted else, elsewhere during rewilding in Britain. Um, so we've gone from that to that, um, and the species have, um, uh, have, have benefited along, along with that. Um, I've been studying the plants and animals at Old Lands for over 30 years now, and I've seen species coming and going. Overall, though, plant diversity has increased in every field and several indicators of semi-natural grassland have spread from their relic patches to become more widespread. Green-winged orchid um, appeared in 2020 in our most flower-rich bank, and even that bank was arable in the 1990s. So we assume that it, it slowly recovered, it naturally gained the fungi which the green-winged orchid needs to grow, and was then able to support the orchid when the orchid seeds blew in from a colony a, co a couple of kilometers away. Uh, there have been some botanical losses. Uh, Dyer's green weed was lost when um, its field was left ungrazed to protect the flowers and it disappeared under tall plants. And the greater butterfly orchid was lost to ivy and bramble because of fertilizer drift into its woodland from adjacent intensive agriculture. Um, birds have shown mixed trends, but with different drivers. Uh, the arrival of red starts and tree pipits. So these are just the, the rarer birds here. We've, we've got all the commoner species as well, but these are the, the rarer farmland birds. Um, they've arrived because our insect fawn has increased. Barn owls have been boosted by increased rough field margins and uh, red leg partridge has arrived and, and, and is breeding. It's a non-native species, but last week I also saw its native relative, the gray partridge, uh, for the first time since the 1980s in the area. Um, Kestrels disappeared uh, in the late 1990s, but they've come back to breed this year as well. Um, and most of the, the, the decliners we've seen here uh, have shown landscape scale declines across the whole of Wales uh, because we've lost so many in insects. So what we've been doing, it's, it's worked on a local scale. Old Lands now has thriving populations of plants and insects, which can recolonize nearby areas which become suitable in the future. But we need to think bigger to counter the nature crisis, um, and that requires knowledge of what's going on elsewhere in the landscape. Um, Old Lands is surrounded by intensive agriculture, particularly to the southwest and the northwest, um, but there are also significant areas of ancient woodland shown in green uh, to the east. Um, if we decided to put trees into our landscape uh, and plant the whole area as woodland, we could act as a link within a network of ancient woodland. But we've also got really important grassland habitats and species here, um, and we form part of a network of scattered gra uh, grassland sites across this part of the county. Um, so, so they're shown in orange on the map. As we saw earlier, grassland species have suffered desperately over recent decades. And to my mind, at least, it's far more important to make our grasslands more connected and resilient than our woodlands. So our approach at Old Lands is to increase tree cover, but not by blanket planting, which is what most people are doing in Britain. Instead, we plant little groups of trees, like the ones ringed here, 
um, across the grassland landscape. And that enhances things. And it means that we're permeable to woodland species, but we also retain our grassland species and they can also move across our, our landscapes. Um, we're also putting in a few little ponds, uh, similar to this one here, um, very, very small indeed, um, to make things permeable to wetland species as well. Um, I think our approach is wilding and is good for, for biodiversity, um, but it's not some kind of idealistic rewilding. It's, it's farming with nature, um, and I guess that's, that's agroecology. Um, so I hope there's some useful stuff there uh, and that, that I haven't, uh, haven't dr droned on for, for, for too long. I'll just uh, stop sharing and um, we can see what Mim has to say. Yeah, I think that's wonderful, Sam. Thank you. And uh, reminded me why, why I asked you to come and be here with us tonight because I, again, learned more listening to the management that you're taking at Oldlands. Um, I wonder if before we jump to Mim, I might give people, we might, if, if there are like two quick questions people might want to ask if that they're burning to, if not, we can move on to Mim and then take all the discussion at the end. People are happy to move on to Mim then and then save up any questions for later. All right, then over to Mim, whose uh, wonderful book I have here that I can recommend to you. Um, I don't think she's expecting to talk about the book, but she's going to talk about things she talks about in the book, probably. So over to you, Mim. Thank you. Um, yeah, my business partner is always saying that I do an absolute terrible job of promotion because I forget to mention the names of any business and I also forget to mention that I've got a book. So, um, yeah, thank you for dealing with that early. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm a lot less prepared than Sam. Um, I don't have any slides or uh, a proper talk outlined, um, so I'm just going to ramble for a bit and hope it makes sense. Um, but I started off um, in conservation and ecology. And then I felt like um, the systems that were supporting humans were sort of the things causing most of the pressure to um, conservation areas or you know wild ecosystems, um, agriculture being one of them. And I switched sideways into agriculture to sort of try and understand why why agriculture produced such a negative, why it seemed to be so negative for wildlife. Um, and I started working on a 120 acre mixed organic livestock farm. Um, and while I was working there, um, I sort of, I learned how to see the landscape more from a farming perspective. And it clashed quite a lot with my training on how to see it as an ecologist. And um, I was sort of wondering how you could see a landscape, how you could see the landscape, how you see the same landscape, from two really different perspectives and why there was that tension between those two viewpoints. Um, and then I started sort of digging into where that tension had come from because I sort of, I felt it personally and I could see it reflected in the culture around me that farmers and conservationists and especially rewilders were often sort of slogging it out. And there was quite a lot of tension in that. Quite a lot of it was driven by having yeah, by seeing fundamentally different things in, in the same area. Um, and I went back for like 900,000 years um, of British history, looking at different species of human that have been here. Um, and that's what resulted in the book. Uh, that sort of like that thought process. Um, I documented it and it sort of accidentally turned into a book when, I, when a sheep dislocated my knee and I sat down for eight weeks. Um, and something that sort of came out of that process for me was an acknowledgement of humans as a keystone species and also as an ecosystem engineer. So in rewilding, a lot of people are intentionally putting keystone species back in, you know, like the wolves in Yellowstone and stuff like that, um, because they're these, like, these very powerful species and ecosystems that are driving a lot of ecological processes. And then, um, ecosystem engineers are also being added back in because of the things 
So an ecosystem engineer is something that, uh, like a beaver is an ecosystem engineer because it can create a wetland in an otherwise dry environment. So you've got keystone species as being really powerful actors in ecosystems and ecosystem engineers as sort of creating areas of difference in ecosystems. And often ecosystem engineers are also keystone species. So there's like, there isn't sort of a clear, you know, these species are this and these species are this. Um, but they're useful sort of frameworks to think in, I think, or I find them useful. Um, so I felt like humans, yeah, even, you know, humans do sort of fit these two, um, you know, we do have the capacity for both of these roles. And I became interested in, like, it's quite difficult just to like release humans into a landscape and then them act in a, like, you know, act, act in a keystone or ecosystem engineer way because so much of our action is covered by our sort of culture um, and our culture is so like damaging in so many ways. Um, so I started trying to unpick some of what might be going on in those interactions and especially those interactions in farming in farm systems because a lot of our livestock are also keystone species so like cows cows are used instead of wild cattle here um, as a keystone and pigs are used instead of boar so we are keystone species and then we're working allied with other keystone species and then overall we create such radically different environments because we've got sort of all this like accumulated ecological power if that's making sense um and yeah so I started to think about this and what helped me a lot was thinking of it all as disturbance instead of thinking of this as conservation and this as agriculture I just think of it as disturbance across a landscape so if you have really really Hi. So disturbance is anything that's disturbing something, obviously, and it can be um, like very high intensity. So like plowing is a really high intensity disturbance, whereas grazing is a less intense, like a lower intensity disturbance. And then the frequency of it is also important. So if you're plowing every day, you're having a much more, a much greater disturbance than if you're plowing once a year. So the sort of like the intensity of it and the frequency of it sort of combining together to make uh, the impact of that disturbance and in areas where you've got really frequent and or really intense disturbances you tend to have low diversity but then you also have low diversity in areas where you have very very little disturbance so something ecologists used to sort of think in terms of succession that you start with this blank slate environment and then um succession you know moves on through annual plants to perennial plants to trees and then in England at least you get like you, the, the idea was that you've got continuous canopy like closed woodland at the end um, but that doesn't actually happen because disturbances are getting in the way of that uh, so like uh, like a tree might fall over or you might get a flood or something like that and it's those disturbances so, so it's either end of the spectrum like either really intense and frequent disturbances or really infrequent disturbances you get fairly low diversity and it's in the middle where you've got a level of disturbance and especially if you've got different types of disturbance interacting with each other across a landscape that you get these really rich mosaics that are really biodiverse building up which is sort of what Sam you know sort of relates to what Sam was saying when they were plowing you know when when plowing was a part of the management diversity was lower but then when you can get areas that are grazed or cut for hay. And especially if you can then, Sam, I think you said that you were not mowing certain areas where later flowering, flowering plants were like knapweed. So that's like a, that's tailoring disturbance a step again, so that you're getting these really, these really intricate networks of levels of disturbance building up and each area supports slightly different types of species. And it's essentially, you know, that is essentially farming, isn't it? Like how we weave in ploughing, grazing, uh, tree planting, you know, how you weave all of those into a landscape is you're essentially just weaving in different disturbance regimes. Um, and I sort of find that a helpful framework to work in. And I also find that um, it's a language that farmers understand and also a language that ecologists and rewilders understand so it's sort of 
it's a way of sort of bridging some of the divides that can occur between different groups um, by sort of neutralizing the landscape, uh, neutralizing the lang language used, um, but something that's still really ecologically valid or like, you know, it makes sense ecologically speaking. Um, and I guess that is sort of what we're doing now. Um, so the book resulted in a business called Holistic Restoration. I'm actually remembering to do plugging. Um, and my business partner's not even here to notice. Um, and so through Holistic Restoration, we teach some of this stuff um, to conservationists and also to farmers. Um, and then through a weird, like a weird twist of fate, um, the farm that I was working on originally when I was thinking about this stuff, when I was starting to write the first bits of the book, uh, became available um, and we were offered it to sort of make real some of these ideas because it was really difficult. It was really difficult to get people to imagine a landscape built up of different types of disturbance and how how that might result in a, like a dynamic mosaic that moves around a landscape and shifts with time. Um, so we ended up getting the farm where we could sort of make these things a reality and we got the farm, we only got it in April. So it's still pretty new. Um, and this year we've mainly just watched to see what's happened um, because we didn't sort of want to go plowing in and plowing in, um, making loads of alterations uh, without sort of realizing what was here first. And it's been really nice watching it, watching it over this year, but also quite sad because it wasn't a massively diverse farm when I knew it 10 years ago. And quite a lot of that diversity is gone um, in the intervening time because the guy's been putting hay quite early. He's had a lot of sheep. Um, he's, he was a conventional farmer, although not particularly, not massively intensive, but sort of still there's things that, you know, like we used to have all swallows in the barns and they've all gone and we used to have yellow rattle in some of the fields and that's gone. And, um, but the sort of, um, you know, we, we can potentially bring some of that back. So we're just at the beginning of that, like Sam's way down the journey and we're just at the beginning of this. Um, but the plan is that we can demonstrate a landscape that's merging these different types of disturbance uh, together on levels that are appropriate like, pro like plowing, there's nothing inherently wrong with plowing, but you kind of don't want to be plowing more area than you have being like not plowed. Um, there are sort of balances, you know, balances where you've got a bit, you know, a small area that's plowed is allowing annual seeds in that might not be able to get into a mature grassland, or it's turning over the soil and any dormant seeds, it's giving a chance to you know come out and express themselves so a small amount of plowing is raising diversity but we wouldn't want to go like too far um and sort of unsettle that system so we're trying to find these sweet spots where we're creating disturbance at a level that's within the stability of the rest of the system where diversity is enhanced and we're trying to find agricultural systems that will do that effectively in our environment um and Ask me in 10 years, I might have some sort of result, but as, as yet, I don't. Um, I don't know that, I don't know that I, yeah, I think I might be done. <laughs> I don't know where I'm gonna go from that. <laughs> oh, that was great though, Mim, thank you. I love, I love that um, description of the role of disturbance and the, and the complexity of the disturbance and frequency and intensity um in the relations because you're right that is farming but that's also that's also non-farming areas you know in the ecosystem so and how they interact which is so interesting and important to all of our members um i actually have a question for either of you before others might want to ask or or say something oh, there's some coming up in the chat too um one thing i was struck by in my time with you up there and as we walked around wakelands you because because of your training you also have eyes for some things that I can't see um I haven't been I haven't been taught how to look for them and some of Sam's work in particular around the different fungi that you wouldn't we would say oh there's fungi <laughs> I would I shouldn't speak for others and you would say but there's only one species and there should be 24 um I'm I'm really interested in how uh those of us who've not been trained in ecology and conservation even, but um, how we can 
we can see what disturbance we've created and what others have created before us. We can see we and we can see changes in in what grows where we've changed practices. Um, but I still feel like there's a level of understanding what to look for to know how to prioritize a habitat for more more diversity, actually, basically. that's that's what struck me about being with you was sure, we don't till here, and even in our own garden, like with nothing, it's all no dig everything. Um, and we use cattle like you do, Sam, you know, we move ours daily. Um, our pigs also, we try not to end up with no ground cover. We try to move them quickly enough so that there's always lots of ground cover. But I, I'm not any by any means expert in how that is um, encouraging particular insects or fungi that then lead to the other things that those things will support. And I'm wondering if you would, what you would say to farmers like us who are trying to use our powers of observation without your powers of training um, to, to go to the next levels of, of observation and, and also where to get more information. And I know you don't know Australian landscapes necessarily, so it is more of a, a generic question of how does one do that? Yeah, it's a, it's a difficult one. Um, and everyone has different skills. So I don't have the skills of farming. I've, I've got some reasonable knowledge from, from 20, 25 years of looking around Wales to see how landscapes are farmed. Um, but I'm primarily a, an, an ecologist. Um, and other people have the skills of, of, of farming, but not necessarily the skills of ecology. Um, one of the things we do here at Old Lands, which sadly is not going to be of much use to, um, to people in Australia, is to have open days and walks where I take people around the fields and show them what some of the what some of the insects are like, what some of the plants are like, um, and point out some of the management that we're doing, uh, which bits we're leaving, which bits we're we're grazing, and and all that kind of thing. Um, and I suspect that local wildlife groups and others across the world will will do will do similar things focused on farmland wildlife. Um, but they they won't necessarily know the farming aspect, and mm. so really the 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 ideal is to have, and and this is what what happens on on our old lands walks, you have growers and ecologists coming to, together and discussing things in the field, and and then the growers learn a little bit about the ecology, and the ecologists like me learn loads of stuff about what is actually practical and 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 what you can do with land. Um, and and every, everyone kind of builds builds to a better place. Um, I'm sure that there that there will be well known local species of of insect or or food plant for insects or something like like that in different parts of Australia. Native species which which will be the local equivalent of the of the knapweed. There will be a flower that provides late season nectar or something like that. Um, so mm. if if you can find out somehow what that is on your land and 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 in, encourage it, try to try to keep nectar sources there through the year, but ideally native nectar sources rather than and ideally perennial nectar sources rather than just sowing in a, a flower rich pollinator mix every every year. Um, then yeah, generally I think the the native insects are more likely to use native flowers by and large, whereas your pollinator insect mixes might be really good for honeybees, but not so good for your native insects. And the native birds will then eat the native insects. So you get that that whole pyramid yeah. thing. Yeah, that's great. Actually, it, it does remind me we've at our most recent food sovereignty convergence, we talked about a project we'd like to get up um, yarns on farms of, of having farmers and the first peoples of that country come together on farms to to learn more from the first peoples about about the country so i've committed to doing that here with the jar um which i have i'm looking forward to doing when i stop yeah. for two seconds um yeah that's something we we sadly haven't really got in the same way uh here in the in the uk um but we've got farmers who've been working with their land for generations as well so um yeah, learning learning from them, learning which which field on their farm they would manage in a, in a particular way, um, is is also a, a, a crucial part of the, the learning process. 
Um, we also don't have the burning thing, and I see that's one of the questions. Yeah, um, it is, and I think Megan's point is an important one, and um, I'm sure that most people are aware of um, Bruce Pascoe and Bill Gamage's new book, uh, Future Fire, Future Farming, which is a um, collaboration they did to talk about that, the importance of fire farming. And he's going to be, Bruce is going to be speaking, um, we're having a conversation at the Oxford Real Farming Conference online in January. There's a session where we'll be talking about um, fire farming and food sovereignty um, and how to bring those topics together. Cool. So, And is that uh, generally done on a smaller, smaller pack, patch, patch scale so that small areas are like burnt? It's, MIMS disturbance, you're getting these these disturbance events of, of fire scattered across a landscape at irregular times. Uh, so once every few years, what, what, whatever the, the scale is, rather than the current approach, which certainly I saw in California, and I'm guessing would be the same in, in large parts of Australia, where we try our absolute hardest to prevent fire. Mm. And then suddenly we get it catastrophic and an entire landscape burns and that's of no good for, for for anything so this kind of patchwork would seem to be the approach yeah definitely and we're seeing the um the emergence of the fire rangers from first people's mobs around the country teaching those skills again um which is oh, cool. really like really great to see because yes the conflagrations we've faced in the last um couple of decades have been pretty bad yeah we'd like to not take the same approach what is it the definition of insanity um do others have questions or comments i actually would just like to say i saw caroline said can you do good land restoration and still feed everyone or do we need a mixture of high tech uh such as mombi and agroecology and um i would just fiercely reply that um small-scale farming already feeds the majority of the world you know, 70% of the world's food is produced by smallholders. So I think in short, yes, we can feed the world this way. And there's a, quite a lot of research to support that position. Um, and no, we don't need high-tech solutions uh, to solve solve problems that were caused mostly by high-tech solutions. So um, I don't know if anyone else wants to respond to that either. You're not here to listen to me. You're here to listen to Sam and <laughs> me. I would just add to that that um, not only do small scale farmers feed most of the world, but they feed it. They feed us on a small proportion of the land area, and the, the you know, but is is it something like thirty percent of the land area used by small farmers feeds produces seventy percent of the food or something like that, isn't it? It's exactly that. Oh. Yeah, yeah. But other than that, no. <laughs> Oh, and, and India, you know, mostly feeds itself you, on, on less than two hectare uh, parcels. Like, it, it always makes me feel so wasteful when, I, when I'm reminded of, of how productive they are on such small holdings in, across that continent compared with us. Um, yeah. Yeah, and and Mon Bombio also has this, this, this false, false dichotomy where he, he basically says farmed land is never biodiverse. And it's just nonsense. It's completely wrong. Mm. Um, sustainably farmed land is, is, as I said in my talk, hugely biodiverse. Yeah. Um, and it may not be as productive as, as, um, as the, the factory farming that we see in so many parts of the world. But, um, but that is hugely destructive. Yeah. It also requires, um, well, agroecology in general requires a lot of hands on the ground, doesn't it? Like a lot of people doing a lot of small intricate disturbances and for me that's like both what's sustaining diversity in that system is the number of people inputting into it and it's also so like a part of the keystone thing is that keystones create landscapes that support them um because if you're a powerful actor in an ecosystem and you create a landscape that doesn't support you you go extinct pretty quickly obviously um so if there were any keystones that did that they would have been sort of weeded out by evolution except humans which are possibly in the process of getting weeded out um but anyway yeah but that um being sort of a keystone human in a landscape is to have is to create a landscape that feeds you and to me there's a really nice thing in there of like having a lot of human actors in a system doing producing food in a lot of diverse ways produces a lot of human food which can then feed a lot of people um in a landscape and to me mm -hmm. there's like a nice cycle in there that you know 
that is essentially agroecology viewed, you know, viewed from a different angle, I think, to me anyway. Yeah, if only we had the data to show the government, hey, like that, you know, agroecology really is bundle berries, more eyes per acre. And that means actually more people are fully employed <laughs> as opposed to what industrial agriculture does. Hmm. Are there questions or comments from others? I mean, how I know there are a lot of farmers here. I'm interested in your reflections on some of the things that uh, we've heard from Sam and Mim about the management of our landscapes and the care for it and what we see. I mean, like, I reckon Randall might be interested uh, to say something about what you've seen up at Echo Valley and the change management and the and the change in biodiversity you've seen on the farm. Thanks, Tammy. <laughs> Put me on the spot. <laughs> Always. Um, yeah, amazing chat. And I, it's really interesting to see um, the uh, similarities in such quite different environmental, but the principles are still the same. And that, you know, that importance of observation and allowing time. Um, it's been interesting on our landscape, you know, after 120 years of monocultured cropping and to allow time for healing and allow plants to do their thing. And we're still in a very, in, in the early days too, but to see that diversity starting to reemerge when you just allow it and the, and the fact that you can um, coexist with, with feeding um, people and, and allowing um, landscape to heal and then to see that, that diversity coming through. Um, yeah, it's, it's quite interesting. Um, I think too on that bacterial some of the stuff that Sam was talking about that, you know, like we, we're quite a bacterial dominant landscape and to see how long it took some of those statistics that Sam shared to get that fungi back in the landscape. It's a little bit daunting to look at those figures because we really do. We, we have really lacking in fungi in our environment. And I think that that was a little bit. Yeah. It, it, did, would you guys, um, Sam and Min, would you guys have any suggestions as a farmer who's trying to build a bit more fungal um, uh, increase in their landscape? Because, you know, under the plough and obviously, you know, to hear that that um, similar managements and 80 years and and that a bit of tillage and then 80 years later, it still hasn't caught up from a fungal position. Um, what things we can do as farmers to support um, increasing soil um, fungal activity. Or fast track that, yeah. Um, yeah, these these fungi, they're, they're slightly odd fungi anyway, these, these grassland fungi. Um, they work with the native plants to help them grow, but they're not the sort of fungi that you'd get in a, in a, uh, a more productive, traditional uh, agricultural lay. Um, think overall soil fungal diversity um, is often highest in quite quite sort of uh, manured systems so you get you get a whole a whole load of fungi that come on manure or come on cattle dung or, or whatever but but there's only this this kind of little guild of fungi that actually work with the plants to help them grow in the same way as a lot of trees have fungi working with the with the tree roots in order to help the trees grow. Um, in terms of actually getting them back on back on land, um, they they won't they won't come into a regularly tilled field. That's that that's just ecologically they they don't these particular things don't do that. Um, but if you've got older grassland, um, I've a local ecologist suggested to me that that these fungi actually uh, they they can't spore across land, which is what fungi would normally be expected to do, um, and they actually live partly in the seeds and other bits of the grassland plants, and so we're mowing our mowing our lawns here and disposing of the mown bits, but actually if we left those to grow tall and seed and then cut those and spread those across our pastures, the grassland fungi might well be able to, to return that way. Um, so naturally they would be, naturally the, the flowers would be flowering, setting seed, cattle or sheep or whatever would 
would munch on those and then the seeds with the fungi inside them would get moved around the landscape as the as the animals uh eat and dung um so i guess if you if you want the whole old grassland biodiversity thing then uh yeah graze graze some of the fields and 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 do a bit of green green hay to um to move them from fields where they where they currently grow <laughs> Yeah, it's amazing. Thanks, Sam. That's something I'd never heard before. Thank you. I um, I know a guy who is working on a so. Um. So, like in a purely um, grass-fed system, I know somebody who's intentionally moving their cows through um, old blocks of wood and older landscapes, and then almost folding them on more disturbed landscapes. To use the cow, you know, instead of sort of collecting, you know, so to use the cow to go and forage across a more broad landscape and then carry it back in its gut and then shit on the um, like degraded fields. And he's having some success with that, I think, like using a cow as a collecting and distributing or, uh, organism, um, which I thought was quite interesting. That's amazing to hear, I have to say. Um... You know, we in Australia, there's a lot of uh, being told to let your cattle graze, uh, not graze, um, choose what they're going to have from a from a salt lick, you know, from a mineral lick. Sort of, you bring in all of these minerals and they self-select, and then that remineralizes your soil. But the idea of actually having an old forest near you, which is foreign to most of Australia, because although it's a much vaster continent, the um, colonists were. Uh, very successful in deforesting it and and degrading its grasslands pretty miserably. Um, but yeah, the being able to walk into the healthy ecosystem and bring that back, that's extraordinary. Um, I don't think we have enough intact ecosystems around over here. It's, um, started with Sam's and I'll give you another grim one, but let's, <laughs> does someone else have a question or comment there? We've got a couple in the um, chats. Uh, can weeds help the land to regenerate or are they to be tackled um i mean i, I don't know what your i don't know what your your weeds are but i'm guessing quite a lot of them started off as our weeds um and then we very kindly brought them to australia uh mm -hmm. and spread them there so I, I know you've got problems with brambles um but i would imagine quite a lot of the um uh the other other weeds uh, in Australia are, are originally European weeds. Um, and uh, certainly some of the weeds here, so um, the, the, the dock, uh, which, which we get a lot in, in fields, um, it's, it's very deep rooted. And if you get really compacted soil, the deep roots of docks will help to break things up and help with aeration. And eventually they, they will help a field to, um, uh, to, to become less compacted. Um, so certainly some of the, some of the weeds do, do potentially help, um, but some of them are so invasive and so problematic um, that they probably are best, best tackled or, or at least minimized. I would, um, I'd also sort of say like from a, or like from my perspective, um, the things that have been classed as weeds are the things that are really common in agricultural systems or like are sort of problematic you know we don't you know are in a are in a proportion higher than we would like to be in an agricultural system and i think that that can be an indicator in itself like when it comes to sort of learning what a landscape saying you know if something has culturally been identified as a weed because it creeps into intensive systems it's probably telling you something about the intensity of your system like, you know, Sam was saying with compaction and dock, we've got dock in all of our gateways because people have been driving tractors through wet gateways for year after year after year. And I think there's like a thing in there about um, reframing how weeds are seen as actually a plant that's probably trying to, you know, a plant that's taking advantage of a problematic, you know, like a far, from a farming perspective, a problematic area. So I don't know if this is making sense. Like we're farming in a way that is, creating weeds 
and they're called weeds because people have been farming in a way um mm. with docks and yeah i don't know if this like translates to australia at all but to me there's a thing in like looking at where weeds are and why why it's there um like what what management has meant that it's there and what management means that it persists there and what management means that it's become problematic um obviously that's quite specific weeds it's not all weeds some are just invasive um but for me i find that quite an interesting way um, i spend quite a lot of time reading about weeds because i think they're some of the more interesting like there's always sort of um groups to target and learn more about in ecosystems aren't there because there are so many things in there that like so I find like weeds to be a way of refining down a lot of that complexity to get something that's gay, you know, to get something that's identifying what's happening in a system quite quickly. And a lot of farmers can identify weeds because they're some of the few plants that they're really familiar with because they're weeds. Um, so I find weeds really helpful anyway. <laughs> yeah, and they are they are often often symptoms. Um, the other the other ones, as as I as I mentioned, the the ammonia um, nitrogen people put fertilizer onto their fields to help fertilize the plants. Uh, but intensive agriculture produces a cloud of ammonia around it, particularly a slurry based system, slurry based pasture or maize or something like that fed to fed to cattle. Uh, you get or, or poultry as well, you get you get these massive plumes of, uh, of basically free fertilizer. Um, and certain weeds here it'll be stinging nettles and docks and brambles um may well be the case in australia as well basically all that free fertilizer just throws everything out um and so the native plants simply can't can't compete so so the weeds there again are a symptom of the intensive management that's being done in the same way as the uh, the, the docks are a symptom of compaction through um through the the tractor usage in in mims gateways yeah, are you too familiar with natural sequence farming? Um, something that Peter Andrews has developed in Australia. So I think a lot of a lot of Australian farmers are aware of different ways of, of thinking about weeds. Um, probably not so different thinking about pests still. I think rabbits and foxes you can have back. We'd quite like you to take them back. <laughs> <laughs> but, We've got too many foxes here, but um, and and that's having real problems for ground nesting birds, um, mm. and that's again that foxes again are a symptom of industrial, not only industrial agriculture, but here industrial pheasant shooting. So mm. the 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 biomass of pheasants released in Britain for shooting is greater than the biomass of all our wild birds put together. Um, phenomenal numbers of, of pheasants which are then shot by people having fun and often then dumped many 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 millions of them get squashed on the roads the foxes scavenge off those um, and so we've got huge numbers of foxes here um, which then cause all sorts of other problems um, mm. so yeah foxes are a symptom too yeah, that was an eye opener for me when I was there. Everybody over there is very grumpy about the pheasants, and and you could see them everywhere. And and yeah, just like understanding that they're, um, yeah, that they're the problem they are just for sport. You know, it's just yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah. And bizarrely exempt from any bird flu um, control as well. What? Which is are you just... serious? <laughs> yeah, yeah. All the poultry's got to be inside, except the pheasants. They can go wherever they like and. You know just disperse across the cat the countryside as much as oh, they like <laughs> that's totally bizarre so yeah so for others when while i was there with sam and mim that because of the avian flu um the government has said that everyone has to lock up their birds right now so all of the the pastured growers everybody has had to cage their birds across the entire um country so but apparently not pheasants <laughs> yeah yeah it's extraordinary um I'm afraid I've got to got to go now. Um, That's all right. It's eight thirty, and I think everybody's coming. meant to go. Thanks. I'd all like right. to thank both of you, and I know you've got school run, don't you, Sam? Um, yeah. So thanks to both of you so much. It's been early over there, and we really appreciate you joining us. Um, and uh, thanks to everyone else who's turned up for what I think's been another really rich solidarity session. I know I've learned a bit more again, and um, I'm grateful we can come together in these ways to learn from people who know something we'd like to know a bit more about and look forward to working out what the next one is. 
Um, so thanks very much, Sam and Mim. And thanks also to Jess for keeping us all organized and coordinated. Um, and uh, yeah, I look forward to seeing what happens next. We'll report back from COP15 about whether we win or lose the battles around biodiversity and agriculture. Um, so thanks everyone and have a, a safe holiday season. Thanks, Tammy. Goodbye. Thank you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Good to see so many familiar faces. <laughs>